Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. So, hello, everybody, <laughs> beautiful audience. Today we are with Martin von Hildebrand, anthropologist, founder, and president of Guy Amazonas. Martin has spent more than 50 years with indigenous people in the Colombian Amazon and has been instrumental of the recognition of their territories of more than 53% of the Colombian Amazon. Wade Davis, Canadian, Colombian, anthropologist, ethnobotanist, and writer. Uh, he's professor at British Columbia University, PhD of Harvard University, and has been one of the most important explorers for more than 15 years along more than 100 countries. And he has definitely been living with indigenous communities and learning from them. I am Silvia Gomez, also anthropologist, and I've lived with the Barasano, Macuna, Taiwan communities of the Piraparana River, with the Guy Amazonas Foundation as well. I then worked with the communities in Africa and the Amazon forest and was the head of Greenpeace for 10 years. Now I am happy to be the executive director of Guy Amazonas. So today we, our topic is indigenous traditional knowledge as a vital force for the future of humanity. Today we are having a conversation. This is not a lecture, so we are going to share some of our thoughts and our experiences of what we have learned and what can we gather for, from what we understood living with indigenous communities and accompanying them in this challenge of being present and relevant in this challenging world. You know? So mm -hmm. Martin, you brought up this topic. So why you brought it up? <laughs> When I brought up this topic, hello Wade and Sylvia, I brought up this topic because I think it is fundamental that we uh, take indigenous cultures seriously. Indigenous cultures, not all of us are the same in this world, not all humans are the same, they are different ways of being a human being. And uh, we have all learned our knowledge, and particularly indigenous people have learned from the forest during thousands of years. And they have a different approach to nature. Basically, they see nature as a large community. Uh, and we belong to this community. We are part of this community. And this is very important because, as Thomas Berry would say, more than a community, it's a, it's a communion of subjects. And uh, all is interdependent. It is a system. Human beings are very important. They are part of nature. And when we say a communion, of subjects, uh, it reminds me of what a shaman Konga Makuna told me once. And he said, uh, when we learn to be a shaman, we look at a tree until we become a tree. And, um, and then talking to another shaman, uh, Karakol Juguna, and I mentioned this to him. And he said, well, Martin, if we are not intimate, how do we reach spirituality? And this, I think, is a very important because the knowledge of indigenous people, they are part of nature, and they knowledge, although they know a lot about plants and animals, but ultimately it is intimacy. It is becoming one. It is belonging deeply, and that's why they talk about spirituality, because they are connecting in a deep way with the whole of nature. And I think this, I'm highlighting it, because in the West we are a bit different, or quite different. And we observe nature. We see ourselves as outside of nature. We see that nature is a collection of objects which we use for our development projects. And consequently, we consume nature. And we, it takes us to problems like the, exactly. the, the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. and this, and, and this, but we do realize now that we have to come closer to nature. We have to come back to nature in a way. We have to come back, and we've already started in several countries uh, we recognize legally the rights of nature, but we don't know how to handle this. The indigenous people do. They've been doing it for thousands of years. They have this intimate relation with nature. So we should take them seriously, we should listen to them, we should bring them to the table, and we should build the future together. That's why I brought this topic, because I do think that in the West, generally we don't appreciate, appreciate indigenous people. We have a tendency to think they're primitive and, in fact, 
In fact, they are highly sophisticated people with a different approach to nature and to the world. But where you've been traveling around the world, visiting indigenous communities, how do you see this? Well, I think your point is really well taken. I mean, um, you know, we, 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 all cultures are myopic, faithful to their own interpretation of reality. And so we sort of look at our world as the world, as if everybody else has a failed attempt at being us, and nothing could be further from the truth. And if we actually take a big step back, we, we discover that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race is a fiction. We're all cut from the same genetic cloth. We're all descendants of the original human ancestor in Africa. But the critical point is if we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, by definition, all cultures share the same genius. And how they use that genius, as you said, Martin, is just a matter of choice. There is no hierarchy in culture. That old Victorian idea that we went from the savage to the, you know, the bar to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of London has been absolutely ridiculed by modern science, uh, you know, no more relevant to our lives today than the notion that clergymen had in the 19th century that the world was 6,000 years old. And this sort of stunning affirmation of the human spirit, genetics has actually come to the fore to prove the fundamental truth of the intuition of anthropology, which was Boazian notions of cultural relativism. And, and, and what this means is that the other people's world aren't failed attempts at being us. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 voices, the 7,000 languages, the 7,000 and more cultural expressions of the human spirit. And what this really teaches us is that every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as perhaps none has a monopoly on the route to divine. And when we step outside of the restraints of our own culture, a culture that was defined by a Descartian idea of, of, of liberating ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith and deanimating the world. Uh, science makes a house cleaning of belief. Uh, the world is seen as a stage set upon which only the human drama unfolds. That may be the norm in the West. It may be the most powerful way of thinking around the world today. But that doesn't mean that it is normal. On the contrary, it is highly anomalous. As I see it, in all the work that I've done on all continents, including Antarctica, um, uh, you, know, you know, where there are no cultures, obviously, in that sense, um, the, the, the norm is something quite different. It's reciprocity. It's some basic iteration of the fundamental idea that the earth owes its bounty to humans, but humans in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. Now, that basic thing can become manifest in, 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 in 10,000 different expressions, but it is, it is a fundamental relationship that makes people not part of the problem, but part of the solution. And the consequences of that in terms of our ecological footprint is profound. I was raised in Canada to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock, a forest with cellulose and bored feet waiting to be cut. That was a fu fundamental basis of our extractive paradigm. That made me fundamentally different than the Barasana, where Sylvia's worked and you've worked, who believe that plants and animals are just people in another dimensional of reality, or in the case of my godchildren in the mountains of Peru, that a mountain is an apu deity that will direct their destiny. The critical thing is not who's right and who's wrong, but how the metaphor, the belief system mediates a relationship between human beings and the natural landmark with profoundly different consequences for that ecological footprint. And that is the fundamental distinction and something that indigenous people can truly teach us. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, building on what you were both saying, it's incredible how in this particular moment of the planet and understanding that any culture has the solution, but how important it is to really open up to different ways of believing. Yeah, like this, what we are talking about when you mm -hmm. say that the, the world is a communion of subjects and not a collection, a collection of, objects. of objects. We can also say that in terms of the relationship between women and men, it, it's very interesting to understand that in, in the forest and with these indigenous cultures, we are not talking about equity or we are not talking about equilibrium. We are talking about complementarity, interdependentness, uh, Reciprocity. reciprocity and how since this is another really beautiful fact that is every single rule law 
task or attitude comes from a story of origin. The anacondas, since the mm -hmm. first day of creation, were given a, a traditional system of knowledge, a system of plants, of uh, rituals that are the ones that mm -hmm. balance the, the daily life. No? And you see how women, for example, express their potential, their true potential, with agriculture, with the, the way in which women take care about children, about life, about the transition of the rituals, the rituals in which men become adults and um, gain the traditional knowledge that they need to live in the forest and to have a family, to be able to hunt, to fish, but not fish and hunt in a disorganized way. There is a reciprocity law that you have to ask permission, you have to generate the spaces, the rituals that are in charge of asking permission, of giving back to the owners of the forest, to the spirits. And women in these realms are absolutely crucial. They are in charge of gathering the manioco, preparing the chicha, uh, holding the energy for the family to be there and not only participate in the ritual but also enhance and promote nature to reproduce and to do what nature has to do in order to um, yeah, generate the conditions for life. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about women and men we are not talking about how to yeah like enhance the, the leadership of women, but it's to really understand that women on their own, since the origin, have their own potential and in a way are the holders of the vital energy for life, while mm -hmm. men are the ones who put order, that heal the world to create the conditions for life, for health, for rituals and for new generations to transfer mm -hmm. and to gain that information and these ways of living in the forest. And we are not talking about forests as something that is separate. It's like women are manioc, you know, like women talk about mm -hmm. manioc and cassava and um, pepper, ají, yuca, coca as sisters, as family as cousins, you know, it's like the garden is the house, the garden, the maloca, the forest is the, is life, you know, so, so women and men in different aspects and in different situations of the daily life look after. So I think that now this feminine energy of looking after, of being the holders, of taking care, of listening, of uh, transmitting, you know, like this kind of subtle energy that Western society in the name of productivity, efficiency, mm -hmm. has basically forgotten. No, and, you know, Sylvia, I, I love what you said, because it reminds me of our good friends, Christine and Stephen Hugh Jones, who went to live and be with the Barasana years ago, and they both wrote books. And Stephen was focused on Yuri Pari and the men's rituals and Yahe. And, and, and meanwhile, Christine was hanging out with the women and showing that the elaboration of, of, man, of bitter manioc, transforming a poisonous plant every day into the daily bread of the society was every bit as, 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 as infused with passion, ritual, metaphors and significance. And it was just a beautiful portrait of two, two parallel complementary realms. And, mm -hmm. and, and that is something we see in indigenous people all around the world. I, I just love what you said. And, and you know, you're, you deserve so much credit because you're one of the great women anthropologists who have been able to unveil those worlds to us. It's true, and I, yes, definitely. And I also think very important what you were both saying, and it's interesting for our society, is that we spoke about the relationship, the relationship with forest, the relationship with, with, uh, between the people and the reciprocity. And for indigenous people, what is fundamental is the relationship. It is not what we might call the rights. We have these individual rights where each one of us, because we have, we're, we believe that we were born with freedom and then we have a social contract which we limit this freedom and then we have rights in relation with the social mm -hmm. contract. The indigenous people obviously don't have this contract, they have a, a tradition. Uh, but what for, for them fundamental is not 
individual rights, but the relationship. How do we relate? How do we build together? How do we relate to the forest? The forest itself is not, when we say the rights of nature, it's not the rights of the river and the rights of the trees. It is how the whole system works. It's the relationships which are fundamental, no? And it is very much what you've both been saying, no? And again, what you were saying about men and women is this relationship, how they, and this was the how they build together. And not that the women say, well, these are the women's rights and these are the men's rights, and which we are caught in because we have a society, a liberal society, which thinks that we're all born individually freedom, and through a contract, we, 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 we submit our rights or our freedom to a certain extent, no? It's, um, again, it's well, I think, I, you know, I think, Martin, they're so directly related. You know, when we, when we tried to um, liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith, when Descartes said that all that existed was mind and matter, um, we also liberated the individual from the collective, which was the birth of the liberal paradigm, but it was also the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. And the idea of community, family, c c the collective was to some extent lost. Uh, you know, and everywhere you go around the world, you see that, that the strength of the collective um, gives a certain kind of balance to the society and the relationship to the world around it, which I find to be very helpful and healthy. Yeah, yeah and it's beautiful because also like being there in the forest and you could see that the collective is beyond humans, no? So when you're traveling in the river and you see a lot of fish that are just right in the surface of the of the river and one would ask why they are not fishing, no, if they're there. And the explanation is, well, they the fish now, because it's the, the, the season of uh, the palms, no? It's the... the the cosecha, the harvest the of harvest, the palm, yeah. they are in their ritual, in their Jurupari ritual. So they are having jahe. The fish are now in the ritual. So one has to respect also the ecological calendar of the fish, of the animals, of the plants, of the palms, of the sacred sites, which when we see these rivers, we only see rapids or cascades, mm -hmm. but the, re the reality is that they are full of meaning, that the stories of origin, the anaconda, were traveling along the rivers because there are places in which knowledge em emerged, you know, and where, where the, the, the relationship between humans and nature has been there and so interlinked since the beginning. And that Stephen Hugh Jones also would say that it's beautiful to see in the rituals how time collapses. Because it's not that we are remembering mm -hmm. the first ritual of the origin, but people nowadays, while rituals are being performed and are being lived, they are actually reviving the first day of creation, the first ritual in mm -hmm. which Jurupari, Yahe, Coca, Tabaco, Manioc were given mm -hmm. to humanity to actually live you know, in the forest. You know, the, you know, this is so important and gets back to Martine's work with Gaia. I remember when Martine and I were um, working together and we asked some elders why they tolerated, had tolerated the missionaries for so long. And in a very poignant response, um, uh, the elders said, well, because they promised to make us human. And of course, this is the essence of colonization, to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. And so there is this assumption that continues that somehow these are primitive people, which is an obscene term. But if we step back to what we've been saying mm -hmm. and recognize that each one of these individuals is a natural philosopher and that they all share the same genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon. Now, just think for a moment, if all that genius is there in a society, all focused on the, on the ecological relationships the metaphysical relationships, the social relationships in a small piece of forest on the banks of the Pira Parana over not just generations, but millennia. Just imagine what that knowledge represents, what it actually is. I mean, you know, if you, you know, there are clan territories in Australia where, where the entire ethos has been stasis. Don't do anything except the ritual gestures to keep this world just as it was since the dawn of creation. So imagine if all of Western intellectual thought had been focused on understanding every nuance of Central Park in New York over thousands of years. Think what kind of knowledge we would have. Well, that's what the Barasana have done. That's what the Makuna have done. That's what the elder brothers have done. 
indigenous people around the world. And this is a knowledge that not only should be recognized, it should be revered. Mm, Absolutely. Completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is fascinating. <laughs> We, we can be here for days, <laughs> but we have limited time. So I wanted to jump into some practicalities, you know, okay. because people might be asking, OK, in practical terms, how can we highlight the importance of indigenous people? What's our task? What's how can we do that? Well, that makes me think, for instance, just take the Amazon, which we all know of is important for, for from every point of view, biodiversity and climate and et cetera. And if we look at the Amazon, we can see that already 28% uh, uh, of the Amazon has been recognized as indigenous territories, legally recognized, and another 22% are, are, have been recognized as protected areas. Mm -hmm. This would be nearly 50% of the Amazon already, of the Amazon rainforest, is already under some type of protection. And, um, but of course, we have deforestation in the south. But if we look at the north of the Amazon, near, uh, close to the Amazon River and north of that area, we will see that we have the longest stretch of continuous rainforest. And um, we can see that that area is already protected about 65%, half of it indigenous territories and half of it protected areas. And we've already highlighted, what we've just said now, the importance of traditional knowledge. Now, this particular area that I am pointing out of the north of the Amazon, uh, that runs all the way from the, from the Andes right across the Amazon to the Atlantic Ocean, is on what we, it's on the equator. We could call it uh, also the, the, the climatic equator. That is, it receives rain from both sides. And it, the trees uh, uh, extract water from subsoil. And uh, through evaporation and transpiration, they create clouds, mm -hmm. no? And these clouds, which we have called the flying rivers, bring 20 billion tons of water across all the way to the Andes, which go right down to Argentina and up to the United States. And if we lose this, we would really be in very serious tr trouble. I mean, many experts have said that 70% of the GMP of the Andes depends on the water that comes from the Amazon, particularly from this particular flying river, which is where most of the water is concentrated. Uh, now, as I said, 50% of the area is already, or, or, or of, this, of the protected area, is indigenous people. This would be a chance, an, an, an enormous opportunity, to continue protecting this area, to complete the protection of this area, the connectivity of this area, each country putting from its own uh, experience, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, we could have a laboratory, if we used to call it, that is connecting and pulling together indigenous traditional knowledge with scientific knowledge and start building together into the future, bringing in innovation, bringing in new economies, bringing in new ways of relating to the forest, but based on this profound knowledge of indigenous people, taking them seriously and building the future of this area as an example also, or as a reference for the rest of the world. So I think here we have an, an, an extraordinary opportunity to uh, build together with indigenous people and obviously our scientific knowledge and technology, which also brings into the into the picture, uh, building a, a an example and and something practical for the future and essential for the future of the Amazon and future of Latin America. So I do think that we have to start doing that, building with them and seeing how important this is because of what we could call the ecological uh, services, uh, because of the largest water pump. Uh, etc. We could bring this. We should bring this together. I think, and it is possible. Mm -hmm. No, I mean we were looking at this with with Wade when we when we worked on this film together on the the, the path of the Anaconda, mm -hmm. and, and 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 so. Uh, what do you think about this, Wade? Well, I mean, I think I'm just reminded. You know that maybe people in the audience who may not know one of your great accomplishments. Um, you know, this is not a pipe dream. This is not just Martine talking. Um, you know, when I first went to the Valpes in 1974, it felt like a very sad place. I was on the Pira Parana, a young kid. Um, it seemed demoralized. It felt like a place where something important happened a long time ago. And then something miraculous happened when President Virgilio Barco in Colombia turned to Martin as a young anthropologist and said, do something for, for la gente indígena. 
And in five remarkable years as head of indigenous affairs, Martin did more than something. He secured legal land tenure for the 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon, collectively lands the size of the United Kingdom. And behind a veil of isolation created by the troubles of modern Colombia, a new dream of culture was born. Cultures are not on a one-way track to uh, uh, desolation or disappearance. On the contrary, uh, how, uh, change and, and technology doesn't threaten culture, power does. And when we went back to the Pita Parana to make that film, uh, there was a wonderful moment because Stephen Hugh Jones, our colleague, had been part of a BBC strand of films in the early 70s called Disappearing Worlds. And he, like everybody, predicted the ultimate cultural exhaustion of the Varasana. And he flew in halfway through our project, saw this maloka filled with indigenous people in full glorious ritual regalia. And he got on the satellite phone to his wife in London and said, Christine, the only thing that disappeared are the bloody missionaries. In other words, in other words, you know, this kind of uh, securing of land. Whenever people say, you know, what can we do? I say, give the land back, whether that's in Canada, Australia, or in Colombia. And as to the question from Sylvia, I, I would put that question back to her. You know, what can we do? Well, I don't believe in polemics or persuasive. I don't think politicians lead as much as follow, but I do believe storytellers can change the world. And I think these stories have to be told, not just by outsiders as intermediaries or interlocutors, but by indigenous people themselves. It's time for indigenous people to become the ethnographers of their own lives, which is one of the things that Guy is doing. But in the meantime, there really is a role um, for, for insider outsiders, you know, people, you know, anthropologists are not some kind of vestige of the colonial past. We, we really want to embrace the activist tradition of Boaz and Ruth Benedict, who said that the only purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. And mm -hmm. anthropology has a role in this, as I think the three of us uh, personify. And so I would ask Sylvia, you know, what do you feel? Because there's a whole plethora of NGOs and organizations and academic institutes struggling with these um, issues. How do we how do we generate um, a kind of collective power that can be effective? Yeah, well, I have two two ways. One is that what that basically what we've done and what we did in the Vida now was also guaranteeing the transmission of knowledge and this intergenerational mm -hmm. um, move, which is crucial. So I think as Western society or as organizations, NGOs, indigenous cultures, what we really need to guarantee is that this knowledge is transferred to the next generation. And not only mm -hmm. transferred in terms of theory or written, but that is alive, that is lived, that is experienced. So mm -hmm. any effort that we can do to promote this, to listen to that, to make more questions, to, to also understand that probably ancestral knowledge and technology are not the opposite, but they can dialogue, they mm -hmm. can complement each other. And young people and new generations are interested in technology, in maps, mm -hmm. in computers, in recordings. So how can we really take advantage mm -hmm. to that? To the, of that, to connect that with the depth of traditional knowledge that the mm -hmm. elders still hold. So I think that transcending that paradigm of technology or uh, ancient and modern, but finding new ways, emergent ways of bringing that together, I think is key. And the other thing that Guy Amazonas and many other allies have been doing is weaving relations no, mm -hmm. and bringing together and creating a network, a network which includes national governments, civil society organizations, indigenous, indigenous leaders, scientists, mm -hmm. politicians, uh, environmentalists, mm -hmm. activists, you know, we, we, we have really been mm -hmm. able to, to do that, to build a network in the Northwest Amazon where Anna is the the example of how we need and we 
we have the responsibility to basically understand diversity and multiplicity because each of the actors has its own dynamic, its own objectives, its own uh, vision, but we need to find unity. You know, it's not about being homogeneous or being unified. It's about finding unity with a common purpose of being able to yeah, to enhance connectivity, which I also think it's one of our key, mm. yeah. our key efforts to guarantee connectivity. Because basically, if we manage to protect or, uh, yeah, preserve isolated parts of the forest, at the end of the day, they would collapse because mm. there aren't any mm. connections, and there isn't like this idea of how important the how important the ecosystems are from the atlantic to the andes and the role of the amazonian forest is like basically these connections no mm. like the like the mycelium like the, the mushrooms mm. you know that they they go in a very subtle way connecting and finding the connections and the relations between the dots so i yeah i would mm. say that this intercultural laboratory of combining science and indigenous traditional knowledge with social mm -hmm. and civil society organizations is key because yeah. we won't do it on our own. We really yeah. need to weave a network that can really shift the paradigm. And where the indigenous knowledge is fundamental. Completely. Because it's a worldview and we have to change our paradigm and we have to tend to uh, to change our paradigm from seeing the world as a collection of objects and understanding that the world is a collection of subjects, that we all belong together and we must live together and we and will not have the well-being of the human beings if we don't have the well-being of the rainforest or of the environment, because it all comes together because that's the whole way the evolution uh, uh, developed, you know? And, uh, and so I think at this moment of crisis, it's fundamental to understand that other cultures have answers which are essential for our future and that we won't make it on our own. We won't make it with the same society that created the problem. We have to sit down and take seriously other cultures and sit them at the table where decisions are made because there's a tendency to say, well, yes, of course, we'll share benefits with them as if, okay, we'll give them some money because they're poor, but we won't take them seriously and we won't invite them to the table. They are not poor. Yeah, that's not the problem. Of course, they can uh, access to Western society and what they need. We understand that and we don't disagree with the benefit sharing. But what we do insist is that they have to sit at the table, they have to be taken seriously, and they have to be listened to, you know? and that we have to build this world together. No? I think that's a, that's a key thing, build the world together. It's not about us, them, you know, this duality. It's what kind of, you know, the whole fundamental question is what kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of world do we want to leave to our children? And I think it's very important that we recognize that change is no threat to culture. All cultures in every place, all through history, have always been dancing with new possibilities uh, for life. Uh, and and the, 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 the idea that, you know, these, you know that, that once these people give up what we identify is their, you know, some aspect of their traditional culture, therefore they're no longer who they are, is completely another form of kind of exploit, exploitation. One never preserves culture. You preserve jam, not culture. Culture is ever-changing. That's the beauty of it. That's the poetry of it. That's the wonder of it. And that's the promise of it, because it means that we can change. It means that, you know, I mean, when I always am asked about climate change, you know, what is, you know, what, you know, uh, what, what, what's the most thing we can do for, for Indigenous people? I always say climate change, not to suggest that we go back to some kind of uh, pre-industrial past or that any people anywhere in the world be kept from the best elements of modernity. It's rather to suggest that the very existence of these multiple voices of humanity, these other ways of being, these other ways of thinking, absolutely put the lie to those of us in our own Western tradition who say that we cannot change when we all know we must change the fundamental way in which we interact with the natural world. Absolutely, and there what you're saying also is something that we must realize that when we're talking about innovation, it is not a monopoly of the Western world. There's innovation in all societies and bringing us together with the cultures in the Amazon, for example, what we're talking about, uh, bring together the indigenous understanding of the world and our science and our technology will create innovation in itself, will bring a new way of thinking and of being in this world. Mm -hmm. And so innovation is something fundamental which belongs to all cultures. And the more we exchange and the more we come together and the more we respect each other, 
the greater the innovation. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, and I think for not only for younger generations, but for all, I think one of the things that you were mentioning, Martin, is to really come back to spirituality, bring spirituality mm. at the center, because basically we've lost our sense of belonging, mm. our sense of gratitude, our sense of praising. And I think nature is our God. And what indigenous mm. people really teach us mm. is that they, they are nature. They, they, yeah. they feel plantly, they live as trees, you know, and that's something that it's, really beautiful to regain to understand to go deep and to regain that intimacy with nature yeah. so that we can really understand that it's something beyond this is not about us this is about oh. a whole no yeah. this is not this is not about humans humans have never been the problem but that that very subtle way in which we can come back to spirituality and understanding and feeling and embodying <laughs> it. One of the problems is that we've been so obsessed with religion and religion is all about exactly. death and, and uh, every yeah. religion, every religion, when it comes down to it is, is, is an effort to fight with eternity and come out on top. But oh. spirituality is something completely different. Spirituality has nothing to do with death. It's all about life. It's all about the essence of life around us in every moment in this moment uh, on a blue planet. And I think that's the kind of spirituality that you're talking about, Sylvia, direct numinosity, a sense of the spirit around us at all times. That, that's really got very little to do with religion uh, and much more to do with the, the, the fundamental miracle of being alive and living on this planet. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. Well, what a privilege. It's we we a want great pleasure. Yeah, we want maybe to invite our audience to ask questions or to share comments since, mm -hmm. since this has been a conversation, like very natural conversation. We would love people to ask questions so that we can keep the conversation going. So